Hello, and welcome to this session from wherever you're joining us today. Treasury has been exposed to technology innovations for many years with access to multi banking platforms, FX portals, and connectivity to global information exchanges like SWIFT. At a recent ACT webinar that I moderated, one corporate noted that they collected more data in 2020 than in the previous five years. So, as treasurers, we're familiar with the use of technology and the massive explosion of data. I don't know about you, but I'm personally inundated with invitations to learn about the latest on API, Swift GPI, ISO 2022, et cetera, and, they can, and how they can really transform treasury functions. However, I don't know about you, but I find many of these confusing. Some feel very expensive to implement, and I'm not sure if my treasury team and my company are really ready to harness the, some of the promised benefits. So today we're gonna to take a break from selling a particular solution and try to identify some of the market myths with the help of an industry expert, Craig Ramsey. Craig's the head of innovation, global liquidity and cash management at HSBC. And a reminder, this is a recorded session and we can't take live questions. But please feel free to drop an email with questions for Craig to technical at treasurers.org and we'll pass them on to HSBC. Now, before we get going, a few introductions. Uh, my name's Naresh Agarwal and after over 30 years working in Treasury, and I provide policy and technical support here at the ACT. Some of my areas of interest are technology and fintechs, and how these have the ability to transform treasury activities to improve controls, increase operational efficiency, and provide greater risk management insights. However, despite a career in corporates and in consulting, I'm still looking for a company that can successfully harness treasury technology. Craig, over to you. Good morning, Naresh. Uh, and for all those watching, I hope that you, your colleagues and all your families stay safe in these challenging times. Um, as you said, Naresh, I'm Craig Ramsey. My official title is Global Head of Innovation and Partners Partnerships. Um, long title, but in short, my job is to help treasurers understand the new technologies that you've discussed. And there are many others that, that you haven't mentioned in the introduction. Um, and try and assess how the businesses can actually take these technologies and help them in these changing times. But it's picking the wheat from the chaff. Uh, to your point, there's lots and lots out there. Uh, and the British expression is, what are the real ones that are actually going to help the treasurer and the treasury's business? Um, so I'm looking forward to, to the conversation. Uh, and I couldn't agree more that um, it's really challenging for that treasurer to harness new technology, just given the level of information they're bombarded with uh, around the greatest, greatest pilot capability uh, and FinTech that wants to sell them something because it's in their interest rather than the, the business's interest. So Craig, you've um, had a long career, 15 years, over 15 years working with corporates. What are your general observations about how treasurers view technology? Well, I, th I think it's um, interesting to just start thinking about the pace of change that we've seen in the last 10 or 13 years, Naresh. Um, the first Apple iPhone was introduced on the 29th of uh, June, 2007. The first iPad on the, the 3rd of April, 2010. Um, it just is incredible that we couldn't actually think um, without living with an iPhone, a smartphone, a tablet, or any of those things. Uh, and it's only been 10 years. The, the challenge though, is a lot of treasurers um, probably came from a time where they weren't exposed to all of these things as, as a child, as a youth, uh, especially myself. My first job, I actually had the ZX81 for, for everybody who can remember what that was. Uh, and it had very, very little computing power. Uh, and I've been very fortunate because I've been exposed to technology. I've been exposed uh, to these things over time, but a lot of treasurers aren't. Um, and if you don't have a background in technology, I think it could be very daunting for, for you to be able to unpick what's happening and, and really translate how these technologies can actually um, influence or improve their business and, and identify where they can focus to support their overall businesses, uh, business objectives. Um, and probably if we look at the last 12 months, COVID is only going to accelerate this. Uh, and probably have treasurers bombarded even further because I think the, the business models uh, through COVID have changed 
quite rapidly. Uh, there's been a lot of new technology being used to help the businesses survive and possibly grow. Uh, one example, we're, we're almost doing it, Naresh, but I'm sure you do Zoom, I do Zoom. Uh, I think it's something we love or hate. Uh, back in 2019, Zoom had 10 million daily meetings. Uh, in April 2020, one month after really COVID hit the globe, they were taking 300 million daily meetings, uh, a 300% increase. Uh, they could do that because they had used cloud technology, they had thought about cloud technology. And people talk about cloud, but they don't always understand how that could impact uh, or improve the businesses. But had you not done that, um, they wouldn't have actually been the word that everybody uses to say a video conference call rather than Microsoft Teams or, or Google um, uh, Exchange. So I think we have to look forward the next 18 and 24 months. Uh, I think the level of change will not slow down because we still are reacting to the world around us. We still have to think about what the future is. And I think the, the challenge for a treasurer is how do I harness this ability that has come to me to be able to actually drive change quickly um, to actually improve their businesses. Uh, and I think as a treasurer, you cannot just look at business requirements, which you might have done in the past, expect another team to actually translate those into what systems or what capabilities you need. I think a treasurer needs to become more technology literate to better understand how their business can harness technology and translate that into impact for their teams and their business. So you've told us a lot about what treasurers need to do. And, you know, I just sit here at home trying to work out how I sort out my own technology. Where do you think these treasurers should be going to for advice? Do they, should they be using a bank like yourselves? Should, you know, who can they trust? Is there a technology vendor they're currently using? Is it the next door neighbour? Where should they be getting this help and support from? Is it all of them? I think Naresh, a great question. All of them will want to give advice for different reasons. Um, I think what you have to do is actually find your trusted advisor. Um, I, I'm married for um, coming on 27 years, 28 years, and my wife is absolutely, she helps me understand how I should, uh, what I should wear, uh, possibly not necessarily for this video call, Naresh, um, clearly got up a bit earlier, um, but she absolutely gives me my trusted advice and I trust her not to judge me. And I think in business, you have to think about those kind of relationships uh, and find somebody that you can actually talk to that understands your business, understands you, understands what you're trying to achieve. Um, it, it's about translating the complex ideas, the new technologies that the banks, the vendors, the fintechs are all talking to you about uh, and actually just um, clarifying, is this really helpful for you? So it could be any one of those, uh, Naresh, but please find somebody that you, you really trust because they should be able to actually tell you what you should be thinking about. And just picking up on your, your final point, these folks telling me what I should be thinking about. I mean, are they really the best, pla best place to understand what my challenges are? I mean, should I rely on them to, to help me work out the questions or actually do I pay, you know, I spent nine years in consulting. Do I pay a consultant to help me work out what those questions are? Because some of them sound really big and complicated. I, I think there's a great expression that I, I've, I've heard um, where people try and sell ice to Eskimos, Naresh. Uh, I think people are um, in this world to try and sell you that actually this is the next best thing, this is a great thing to do. Um, I, I think as an individual, as a treasurer, what are the real genuine problems that you are having to solve and have a list, have a top three, uh, and within those three, have a real clarity on what is trying to drive that problem. So cash flow forecasting is something that a lot of people are talking about, but is cash flow forecasting all about getting a, a, a better system or can you actually do more with what you've got today? Um, do you need more data points to be more accurate within the cash flow forecasting or is it actually just having better access to the data you have at the moment that will actually allow you to do it? Um, don't always believe machine learning and artificial intelligence um, if you actually just um, put it beside data will actually give you the forecast. Um, how can you trust the output? 
Um, I think it's a great point that says um, a, an algorithm gives you an answer, but have you gone through and thought through why that is the right answer and validated it? Um, I, I, and think about the scalability um, and how you can actually future-proof the solution because a lot of companies will come to you and they'll solve it for a particular small part of your business for a unique use case but actually, can that be rolled out very easily? Can that be done in a way that, that um, you, are, you are comfortable with? So I think finding those problems, having that as a list is really going to be critical as you actually try and myth bust the technologies that are being bombarded at you on a daily basis. So would you say that what we should do maybe is maybe not be distracted by the technology and by the labels around the technology. And, you know, we, I, I know we can have a debate for an hour on what is actually AI, machine learning, et cetera. And that, you know, we, we hear it quite often, but actually it genuinely is about going back to basics. And as you say, working out what is my key challenge, what is my key problem I need to fix? And then trying to find what the solutions could be, because I know sometimes it's quite sexy. Somebody shows you a, a really flash whiz bang solution that looks you know really impressive and it's very easy to get caught by wanting to have the same yourself um but but part of what i'm hearing then is it is really important to you know to at least park it and spend time really focusing on you know maybe just a bit of paper on what are you sort of you know your few key issues that you genuinely have is that what you'd be saying to people Absolutely. Right. And I think, again, if you think about a lot of the fintechs, they are very, very clever people. I meet some hugely intelligent and very, very forward thinking people, but it doesn't always solve a problem that a treasurer has today in a way that actually it just executes efficiency, value, brings something to the party. Uh, and to your point, people can get sucked into this beautiful solution for one percent of their business uh, over one day of one year but actually as a treasurer you are facing problems every day your teams are trying to do things every day and i think you have to have a balance you always yes need to look at the future that these people are, are bringing to you but are you actually just improving every day-to-day -day things and i'm sure we're going to be talking about some of those opportunities um in the next uh, little while naresh but have a balance don't just put everything into this wonderful shiny new toy that could solve a unique problem for yourself because that doesn't help your business on a end-to-end day-to-day basis and and that sort of takes us to the next point around you know i i've i've Again, in my career, things like deploying SAP or Oracle was the big thing. Everything would become so much easier with these big transformational uh, rollouts. Um, creating host-to-host -host connectivity with my bank would provide a whole range of, um, you know, genuine benefits. But these are pretty, you know, that's like a one-year, two-year program. Is that part of what you see happening now, what you'd recommend to corporates to think about? I think a lot of corporates have gone down that journey in Eresh, and so you have to complete to a point. I think the future proofing that we touched on is in the deployment of these technologies, are you able to also connect to visualization tools? So I know a lot of people are talking about Tableau, they talk about Power BI, there's lots of visualization tools out there. I think that to harness data, and then visualize it to allow you to actually have a very easy interface that allows you to be able to interpret all this information to allow you to think about the next best action is something that i think is going to be really important um, because we're all time poor and we're getting time poorer so yes the technology is there but is it helping you and are you having tools that allow you to actually identify the 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 elements that you should focus on uh, that's actually going to give you the, the benefit and your teams. Uh, and I think that customer experience, that user experience is certainly something that has been thought about or is being translated from the consumer side into the, the business side more and more. Okay, that's great. And um, I was going to ask you a bit about, you know, one of the big, big areas for treasurers is really around the, the sort of payment experience. Um, could you tell me a bit about how you see the sort of frictions around the payment experience? 
I, I think because um, I know I just add more colour to that from a consumer perspective. Um, I know it's really easy, but it's still pretty clunky uh, in a corporate environment. I, I think that I should, it's a great, great question. And I think if you have Amazon one click, um, that was a, an excellent exam, example of how Amazon makes it really easy for my sons to buy lots of things, my wife to buy lots of things without any friction called coming to the husband and saying, can we afford it, Naresh? Um, and that's a lovely frictionless experience because you literally click one button, it's bought, and actually through Prime, it's delivered next the next day. Um, and I think that experience where Amazon have thought through that what is the need? The need was actually for the parcel to be delivered very quickly. Um, the payment element is just one part of it. Um, and I think what we are seeing in businesses is how can we start adopting some of those consumer activities and bring that into um, business to business. Uh, examples for ourselves on um, the mobile app that we have on HSBC Net, we have a mobile app because we're seeing lots more treasurers are wanting to actually access information of, over a mobile app. Um, we're actually allowing you to use Touch ID um, uh, to just log in. That's a consumer experience that's now being applied to a business tool. Um, we're also seeing treasurers becoming far more comfortable to interact over a mobile app and make payments whilst they're actually um, out and about, uh, not in an office environment. And that growth uh, has actually increased through COVID because again of home working. So I don't think friction necessarily has to be there. It has been there because of the way businesses have thought through today and because of how um, systems are linked. But I think there's going to be a trend on trying to remove that friction over time and learning for the consumer experience and applying it in a business to business sense. Okay, that's great. And, you, you know, part of, part of what I've heard many people, well, I shouldn't say many people, um, part of what I've been told is that, you know, payments represent a really strong revenue stream for, for banks. And anything that makes it easier for me is cutting into your revenues. And so you, you know, part of the reason why you're slow adopters for corporates or enabling corporates to be slow adopters is because the impact on revenues. I mean, do you have a view on that? I, I, I think there is our payments um, contribution with some of the fintechs that have come into place, the likes of the Revolut, the TransferWise, the Stripes, um, the Starlings of this world. I think they're really challenging the, um, uh, the existing status quo of how payments are being done and charged for. I think also regulators with open banking are trying to look at it. And it's not just banks, you've got the scheme fees with MasterCard and Visa. Um, I, I'm quite optimistic that I think the, the banks from a B2B world um, are actually learning from what is happening with some of those um, startups and they can see the, the revenues those organizations are getting focusing on customer experience and they're not thinking about their historical revenue pools and their revenue options. And I think to be successful going forward, you have to really think about the client's client uh, and creating a client experience that is actually sticky. Because ultimately, you might be able to protect your fees for a year, for two years, but at, over a five to 10 year period, the, to your point, the payment landscape is changing. And so banks have really a, a decision to make. Um, and for us, the new products and solutions that we put in place, we now don't design them unless we have clients involved and actually have the clients' clients involved um, to really understand what is the problem we're trying to, to, to solve and what is the experience those clients want. Um, and I would hope with that focus, with the ability to actually focus on our clients and our clients' clients, um, revenues, revenues will come. Uh, and actually there will be new revenue pools that can actually be associated with it. And so you don't have to think about the, the challenge that you've, that you've got. It's not always a, an opinion that's um, agreed with across my bank and other banks, but I'm the innovation guy. I have to have my glass half full Naresh that I think we can actually see that as going to be a benefit. And I think part of what we, we consistently say to a lot of the members listening to these things is for all the complaints we may have with banks, what we should be doing is really challenging the banks. And I, and I, I like when you talk about having customers 
you know, having focus groups, having and listening to customers, what corporates are looking for and what corporates and their clients themselves need to help you refine your products. And I think, you know, hopefully you'll echo this, but part of what we should be doing as corporates is really understanding the roadmap for the banks, really challenging them. So if you think we are getting a really rubbish customer experience, um, not accepting that that is normal. I know, you know, we've, I've grown up always feeling it was a really rubbish experience and that was all it could be. I was often told by my bank or led to believe by the bank that if I wanted the security, um, then that was the price I had to pay a big mainframe delivering rubbish, but secure data and transactions. And I ultimately don't want to lose my money. If I have to do it through, you know, three different tokens, etc., then I will end up doing that because I don't want to be the one standing in front of the CFO saying that um, we got compromised. So, um, okay. So, so one of the other myths we talk about is around, you know, B2C and um, collections and payments. And I know you mentioned Stripe as an example of some of the fintechs who are really re innovating in this space. Could you tell me a bit about where you see um, this space moving? I think um, payments is a entry point for a lot of the fintechs nourish and people are being using the payments element uh, and the moving um, collections uh, as an area that they can um, try and grow from. So Stripe, yes, Adyen would be another good example, um, but Stripe I think is really interesting. Um, if you actually look at Stripe's vision, um, they talk about being the um, payment experience for the internet. Um, and they just want to make it absolutely seamless and easy for anybody to exchange value on the internet. Um, three, four years ago, their evaluation was under $10 billion. Um, you look at today, I think they're valued uh, currently at about $72 billion. Uh, wow. And they're doing that not just on a payment space. Um, they are actually valued more than a lot of banks. Um, and they've done that because they've expanded their services beyond just the payments. So if I go to Stripe, um, they are actually giving me um, uh, insights, data insights on the payments. So yes, they're using technology, but they're thinking about the value I have as a payment organization. Um, they have Stripe Capital, so they're doing loans. Um, they actually have just literally launched um, a, last month a, a service in the US about allowing through their partner channels, the Shopify, um, small businesses to open, open up a bank account. So now Stripe is not a payment service, it's allowing a banking service through a banking partner, it allows loans, it's allowing intelligence and it's expanding itself into allowing how small businesses can grow through their relationship with Stripe. Uh, and I think, again, that's a very interesting space that not just Stripe are looking at, but there's a number of other uh, organizations, even some of the larger technology houses, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons. And so for, for a bank, we have to think about how we respond to that because that's not going away any anytime soon. So this brings us on to our, one of our other myths around, say when I grew up, if you don't have the word bank in your, in your institution, then you weren't doing anything in the space. And, and you know, as, as treasurers, we all know that there are, you know, existing, you know, you talked about Revolut, there are new emerging, we all hear about what will Amazon do next, Google, etc. I've, I've come across terms like banking as a service. Could you give a brief explanation of what it is and where you see that taking? And again, what that means for treasurers out there? Certainly, no, I should. I... Banking as a service is is becoming a more common term that you're starting to see on your um, daily news feeds, your weekly news feeds from, from around the world. And Goldman Sachs uh, recently just announced the foray into um, uh, the, the world of um, uh, trade, and um, trade services. Um, they've talked about banking as a service as the way that they're going and that um, within five years, Banking as a service is a $32 billion opportunity for banks um, or other um, um, companies in the US by 2025. Um, what is banking as a service? Because it's a great term, but what does it mean? It, it really is quite simple in my mind. It's where actually the, the friction that we had talked about earlier, Naresh, or, or the possible friction, um, 
tries to be removed by you actually embedding it into um, a, a process or a value chain that you have as a business. Um, if I actually combine this with also something that people are talking a lot about, dis digital ledger technologies and smart contracts, um, probably a, a nice way of trying to frame it is when you receive goods um, in the future, if you have um, a ability to actually receive the goods on the dock, you have a QR code or a barcode that scans the goods in. Um, if you actually could embed services that says, I will initiate the supplier payment because I have taken those goods onto the dock, I have confirmed that they are good, and I will make payment 30 days, 40 days, 45 days hence, which is actually what our, our contract has, has been done. That is a very, very small example of banking as a service for an organization. Um, the benefits is you've embedded the reconciliation, the authorization, all in technology into a, an automated flow. You've made the payment, so you don't have to have the, the accounts receivables, the, 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 the ability to play. Um, for a treasurer, however, that has some quite significant knock-on effects to how you can manage your cash, how you manage how you've got cash in certain places. So you're going to see your businesses wanting to do these things. You're going to see people outside your business persuade business people that this is a really great thing to do. And as a treasurer, you have to just be ready to make sure that you're aware of the conversation and can place your business requirements into any of these things. Because the worry for me is as banking as a service happens, it kind of happens outside of the treasury teams and they don't get involved. And then you find you've actually got a problem because you haven't been aware of how the business is doing it. So that's just a very, very small, small example, but you could think about that in lots and lots of ways within any business that you're working in. So, and I guess this, this comes back to one of my concerns I often have, which is, as a treasurer, I didn't really get too involved in AP, NAR, AR activity. But listening to what you're talking about, about how these things are moving much more broadly across an organisation. Um, is this why, I guess part of what I'm hearing is, we definitely need to make sure we understand what's going on as treasurers and we provide some input into that conversation. I think so. If you think about that, that concept of banking as a service, all of your financial elements are being embedded into the business. Um, as we talked about treasurers not necessarily being technology savvy uh, at the beginning, um, if I am a business person in product, I may not be treasury savvy. Um, and so there's a learning and there's an education between the two parties. Yes, I think treasurers need to become more techno technology uh, competent. Um, I also think we as treasurers um, will have to educate people in the business about what happens with the movement of money, what treasuries are doing, what is important. And as business processes are changing, we can ensure that actually we're not putting at risk all the controls that we as treasurers have been putting in place over the last 10 years and working towards. And I think it's that opening up and being aware that the silos are being knocked down and technology is helping breaking down those silos. So what is you as you, you as a treasurer, your treasury teams doing to help em, embed yourself in your business? Okay, and I think that's really important because because we do talk about treasurers being more involved in businesses. But I know when I talk to treasurers, they are so busy running BAU, just keeping things going. That actually that's that that's a challenge which sounds very easy but i think it's actually quite hard to deploy and again i wonder if part of what what treasures we should be thinking is that through engagements with folks like yourselves the insights you're providing um we need to make sure we're pushing through and challenging the organizations as to how well as a, across the entire organization we are harnessing some of this technology uh, and as you say not being skewed by one area versus another? I think, again, it goes back to what we said. If you understand the problems you're trying to solve, Nirosh, you can challenge the banks, you can challenge your fintechs, you can challenge your businesses and how they're solving that problem. Um, but you have to always have in your mind what are the real core tenants of treasury that you're trying to work on and improve. Um, and yes, we are time poor. So that's your trusted advisor helping you actually going, well, if I only have so much um, time available every, every every week to this, 
am I actually concentrating on the right things, on the important things that actually are going to impact me as a treasury, as a team today? And can I actually trust my advisors, be that banks, be that um, consultancies, um, to educate me on some of the more out there things, and we'll probably get to it, but the whole central bank digital currency kind of um, debacle that is coming up and around, that's just a great example of, you know, a lot of treasurers going, by God, you know, I'm being asked about this, what, what should I be saying to my CEO? Um, but we might, we might get time to get to that one, Arish. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so we'll try and speed up some of these questions. Uh, cyber attacking, um, can it be prevented? Is it a role for the treasurer? Has confirmation of payee eliminated it? And is it just a way that the banks have given the responsibility and pushed it down to their corporate customers? I think we uh, within HSBC have do, do a lot of work continually to help prevent fraud and help prevent these attacks, Naresh, but we can't do it alone. Um, so yes, always corporates have to take this responsibility really seriously, but I think banks have a, a really important role to play. Um, we've again used uh, fraud monitoring tools, implemented those. That, that is, yes, the technology is machine learning and artificial intelligence, but it's about actually preventing fraud. And one particular client, we managed to prevent a $650,000 fraud um, because we actually had real-time fraud monitoring. We actually went to the client and said, this doesn't look right. And the client said, thank you very much. Um, so I think absolutely banks are still responsible and should be um, doing that. Um, I think ultimately um, you have to think about how you are taking the, the fraud seriously, how your banks are taking it seriously. But when you talk to fintechs and the, the smaller organizations, how seriously are they taking it? And I think regulators are having to be challenged by the, the whole confirmation of PE, the open banking regulations, and they're trying to push innovation, but are they doing that? That is opening up um, risks to the consumer uh, or to small businesses around fraudsters, um, uh, bad actors taking advantage of some of the, the, the loopholes. I think that's going to be a constant challenge for not just banks, but treasurers, businesses and regulator regulators. The more digital we get, Naresh, um, the easier it is not um, to, to take a small amount of money. Um, I, I joke back in the 60s, the bank robbery, the, the bank robbers were constrained to the physical vans that they could take and the gold they could put onto a van. In the digital world, there is no constraint to how many zeros I can type on a computer and remove from a bank account. And I think that's really the challenge the treasurers have to, have to balance. No, it's, it's, they're fair points. Um, so so to, again, in terms of one of the things around banking as a service, um, Pen reconciliations, we know that treasurers spend a bit of time on that. AP and AR teams spend an inordinate amount of time on that. Could you share with us um, for a couple of minutes just on what pen reconciliation is coming through as a, as a sort of banking service? I think, again, what banks are trying to do, and HSBC is um, no different, um, how can we create tools that allow you to uh, increase your straight through processing? Um, and allow you to do automated reconciliation so that your um, teams are actually just focusing on the um, outliers um, that have a, a real problem rather than possibly poor data constructed, um, not having all the information that allows you to, to actually automate the reconciliation. So we're thinking about tools that can actually have visibility, not just for you as a client um, to work between the teams to actually answer some of those questions, but to actually surface it to their client's client. We call it the, the digital account receivables tool, um, but that is, allows um, for a far more streamlined way of actually exchanging information about payment reconciliations in one tool, rather than using a lot of offline phone calls, emails, and all those kinds of things. Again, it's a small step. Um, you could talk about having, you know, more, streamlined, full, automated reconciliations through uh, using data lakes and all those kinds of things, but it's a simple step and it, it is a tangible value to you as a business. You should be thinking about those other things, but that's actually just solving a real problem today. Um, and I think that, again, is how you break down uh, the thought processes. What is today's problem? What is a future problem? And have that balance of, of solving those things. 
And I think we've come out things that people are doing today. Is that right? This is not next year, the year after. This is things that nope. people can do today. Yeah. Okay, that's very brilliant. Simple steps, very simple steps uh, and concentrate those because, again, I think we in banks and consultants think innovation is this futuristic thing. But innovation to a corporate treasurer is if I save 20% of my staff's time, that's true innovation because that really is solving yeah. a real problem. Super. So one of, the, one of the things we talked about earlier is around data and the real sort of volume of data. Um, and when we look at treasurers trying to analyze large amounts of data, what are your sort of observations around that? And what sort of tools can things like banks and other organizations provide? So, so I think you've got structured data, Naresh, and you've got unstructured data. And I think the structured data, in essence, it's the fixed fields that we ex expect require for, let's say a payment. We've talked about payments a lot, but it, it could be different things. So I think there's really a clear um drive to have structured data where possible because if you have the structured data right within organizations you understand the golden source of that structured data that should drive lots of improvements in all the processes we've talked about payments reconciliations but lots of other things because it helps with um, cash flow forecasting and other things I think a lot of people talk about unstructured data nowadays um, and capturing unstructured data that's more longer term because the unstructured data is the context of why that structured data, that payment, let's say, was actually made. And I think in the future, that structure, the unstructured data is going to help you understand the context and possibly create value from the context that allows you to create that insight that we talk about using um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. But because of the vast unstructured data, to your point, treasurers are saying, I'm capturing more data in 2020 than I've captured you know, before. You can only use technology to try and actually derive insights. Um, and I think we're still at that earliest stage where what are the real insights? How do you actually take the balance of structured and unstructured data because a lot of co companies are still creating the data elements to be accurate, to be right. Uh, and they talk about the data warehouses, we now talk about data lakes. It's just about having accurate data where you can rely on because if you analyze poor data, what are you gonna get? Poor results. So I guess part of what I'm hearing in terms of myths, is it fair to say that rather than it's one or the other, it's a warehouse or a lake. It's a bit of both. And that I shouldn't be, I shouldn't feel that the future has to be structured or the future has to be possibly unstructured, but I, I sort of need to accept that there is still a, an evolution that I need to participate in around areas. Is that fair? I think so, Naresh. If you are sat there and go, do I throw everything onto the cloud? that allows all the structured and unstructured data to be analyzed. Um, I don't think any business should just throw everything into the cloud uh, and think that something's gonna happen. I think you have to take it in a stepped way. And again, it comes back to what are the problems I'm trying to solve by actually allowing that data to be analyzed. And it might be that there are key elements that with um, some unstructured data from um, the web, it helps your cash flow forecasting. So actually I will take a segment of my data, I will take it, I will put it into the cloud, I will combine it with unstructured data, but because I've got an outcome in mind, I've done that in a, in a controlled way. So yes, I think it is always going to be about balance. In life, it's very difficult to have a zero or a one answer. It always seems to be something in the middle and your job as a treasurer is to try and balance what that middle is. Okay, but I should be confident as a treasurer that I shouldn't be forced into having to feel there's a decision I have to make one way or the other. I agree. Okay, brilliant. You talked a bit about um, the current hot topic, central bank digital currencies. And I, I wrote quite a lot last year, surprisingly, and I found lots of more material to write. Um, I'm still waiting for the chief exec to sign off my expense trip to Bahamas to actually see how a digital currency works in practice. Um, but whilst I'm waiting, and for those um, listening to this and, and watching it, could you just share a couple of minutes about what they are and, and what you think they mean for treasurers this year and next year? So, so 
Um, I have the privilege of sitting on the World Economic Forum Central Bank Digital Currency um, um, team. Uh, I've worked with um, Singapore, Monetary Authority of Singapore, Bank of Thailand, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Bank of England, Bank of Canada. Um, we're working with the Digital Dollar Project. Um, we, HSBC, have recently um, been um, awarded some work with uh, the Bank de France uh, around Central Bank Digital Currencies. Um, and I have some time that I can devote to this, which is great. Um, but be very clear, there is a long road before central bank digital currencies will be mainstream. Yes, the Bahamas, and I'd love to join you on that trip, Naresh, when we can fly again. Uh, we'll probably both have to have had that vaccination and make sure that um, it, it's valid. But I think there's lessons to be learned in small ecosystems like the Bahamas on how a digital currency can actually be applied, both at a domestic level uh, and also on a cross-border basis. Um, you also have e krona So in Sweden, there's some work that the, the Sweden government is doing, but I know some of the Swedish banks are nervous around how that's being applied. Um, you also have the digital one. So China and what they're doing, it, it's very interesting. But, that's interesting to me because I'm interested in that topic. It's really interesting to lots of consultants. It's really interesting to, to write lots of articles. But for a treasurer on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's unlikely in the next 12 months to come to life in, in any way um, or on, a, on a mass scale. And I think the real question is how quickly that would happen. And I think it's still some years away. Um, I think it's going to be applied domestically. So you, if you are operating in some of the more progressive countries, yes, you might have to think about it as a treasurer, but a central bank digital currency will just be another form of payment, just as we have cash today, just as we have checks today. So I wouldn't get too worried because it will be up to the banks and the regulators to really do the hard work. As a corporate treasurer, you will just see that as a new method of payment. Uh, and then on a cross-border basis, I think that would take longer. The one area I would okay. say, um, the issuance of bonds, so treasurers are, are often uh, um, uh, working in that space, that I could see, because we've done some work with um, the Singapore Stock Exchange and there are other stock exchange out there, they're looking at actually, can you deliver bonds using central bank digital currencies or the expression stable coins? So if I was a treasurer and I had to focus on anything, I'd probably, read up on the bond element and the security services element of central bank digital currency stable coins rather than anything else but i'd actually go to my trusted advisor or my bank and just go give me the cheat sheet guys um and that would probably satisfy you for the, at least the next 12 to 18 months okay super well we're we're sort of, i think we're about to finish but before we go craig can i ask you just to fare a few final thoughts we talked right at the very beginning about these myths um, and you've taken us through quite a lot of um, topics. What are sort of two or three things you want to leave treasurers with listening to this uh, session? So I, I think um, as a treasurer, uh, we always have to develop. So I would love treasurers to think about how you can become more techni technology literate. Uh, easy, or not easy to say, uh, not e easy to do either, Naresh. Um, and that could be through self-education, it could th be through a trusted advisor, it could be through talking to consultants more, it could be talking to banks more, but really think about how you become more au fait and comfortable uh, so that you're not um, uh, worried about technology and you can actually take that on, on board. I think have a clear plan of what you're trying to fix. I can't stress enough that if you don't know what is the problem you're trying to solve, then you are likely to get put into a cul-de-sac by people coming and selling you something that you don't actually need. Um, and balance what you're trying to do. Innovation is not a central bank digital currency that might be applied in three years time. Innovation to you is solving a problem you have today as much as those. So have a balanced portfolio. Um, and finally, I guess, you know, take what you read with a pinch of salt. Don't believe everything you read. Um, and actually ask people uh, for advice and don't be afraid because I, I always believe there is no such thing as a silly question. Um, and actually by being confident and asking some relatively simple questions often can be really insightful to how people are thinking about solving problems. So those would probably be the three things, Naresh, uh, I, I would ask treasurers to take away. 
Well, thank you very much. We've reached the end of our time, and uh, I hope you've. I've definitely enjoyed listening to some of the myths being debunked. Um, thank you, Craig. My thanks to HSBC Global Asset Management for uh, supporting this event. Uh, my name is Naresh Agarwal. I put on my roll top, trying to be a Steve Jobs lookalike. Um, that's my contribution to the innovation. But um, enjoy the rest of the day, and thank you. <laughs>